So I want to, uh, for this evening, talk a little bit about the topic of what we call sila, or ethics, morality, from a Buddhist perspective. And um, the first thing that we notice is that uh, sila is a very uh, intrinsic part of Buddhist the whole kind of um, spectrum of Buddhism. The little verse that I just uh, recited at the beginning uh, when uh, samadhi is is imbued or like soaked through with sila, with virtue or with ethics, then it's of great fruit and great benefit. When wisdom is soaked through with samadhi, it's of great fruit and great benefit. When the mind is soaked through or imbued with wisdom, then it's completely freed from all defilements. So this is the uh, summary or the encapsulation of the Dhamma which the Buddha had taught uh, time and time again, especially in the last period of his life as recorded in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. And so this little formula expresses very beautifully how uh, these different aspects of Buddhist practice are intertwined and interlinked and in particular how, how sila or ethics are, are so important as a basis for these things. Of course when we, we look at uh, uh, traditional Buddhism as taught in, as passed down through the, the cultures then very often you know the, the, the most basic thing that happens, especially in Theravadan countries, of course, is you come along to the temple once a week or once a fortnight and then you take the five precepts. And, um, of course, it's got nothing to do with actually keeping the five precepts. It's a different matter altogether. But you do a a ceremony when you recite them in Pali without actually, usually without knowing uh, what they mean. Or even if you do know what they mean, you don't necessarily have an intention to keep them. And uh, Ajahn Brahm, of course, always tells the story of the, the custom that they had sometimes in Thailand where uh, you, you hold your hands in Anjali when you're reciting, but if you didn't want to keep one of the precepts, then you sort of fold down one of your fingers like that <laughs> when you're chanting. <laughs> and then a few people had two folded down. And some people were kind of like this as they were chanting, <clears throat> which at least is kind of honest. And... Um, in a way, that's very silly, isn't it, of course? But in a way, it's, 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 at least it's kind of something. It, it, it doesn't necessarily, keeping the precepts in that way, it doesn't necessarily, obviously it's not the function, it's not the right way to keep precepts, but in some way it's, it's, it's like it functions in that, in that environment. Not so much, really, as, as a way of practicing, because people will quite happily... Uh, you know, take the five precepts and then, you know, be be swatting mosquitoes and so on while they're taking the precepts and just walk straight out of the monastery and go and get drunk or something like that. That, that means nothing to them. But but what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's an affirmation of a shared system of values. So within that culture, it's quite uh, accepted. For example, when I was in Thailand, it was normal. Everybody, for example, everyone kills living beings, and especially when you're in rural areas, people don't think anything of it. They go fishing or they kill the insects or whatever. It means nothing to them in terms of actually doing it. 
but they still hold that as a value. If you try to tell them that there's nothing wrong with it, they'll disagree with you very strongly. They, 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 they know that it's wrong, and they don't try to deny that, but they just say, well, <laughs> I'm weak, or I have to, or whatever, and they say they do it. And uh, this, is, this is actually one uh, problem uh, in Thailand for the spread of Christianity in Thailand because uh, the two things that Thai people find very, very hard to accept is that the, the Catholics and the Christians tell them there's nothing wrong with killing animals. And people, that Buddhists just cannot accept that. They know that it's wrong. And any ethical system which justifies killing of animals just can't be right. Even though they don't do it, they don't actually keep the precept, but they know that it's wrong. And the other one is drinking, uh, drinking alcohol. And uh, it's very hard for them to have respect for, for example, for priests who are drinking alcohol. And they not only drink alcohol, but it's part of their sacrament is actually <laughs> to actually in the, in, the, in the service is actually drinking wine. And it's very, very hard for them to accept that and to respect uh, the taking of alcohol and drugs. So these are two things which uh, limit the... Um, possibility for Christianity to spread in places like Thailand. And so there's these two rather distinct uh, ways of looking at the precepts. One is as something to actually take and practice in your life, which is obviously the best way to look at it. But the other way is, even if they're not something which you're going to actually do, at least it's a, it's a value system which you can um, respect. And so there's a sense in those countries of a respect for those values. And, and, and so coming in and reciting them as a community is a way of affirming that there are certain social values which are upheld within that community and which are respected, uh, even if they're quite uh, humble and quite honest about the fact that they can't actually keep the precepts or don't even try to really keep the precepts themselves. So this is... Uh, um, and and when we when we listen, if you listen to the talks, the the Dharma talks within those kinds of environments, uh, very often the talks, especially the talks for lay people, consist of basically telling people to keep the five precepts and uh, do and various kind of stories and so on, which are trying to encourage people to do that. And, and this is something that I, I noticed uh, a difference between. Uh, discourse or talk about ethics within Buddhism and within uh, Western philosophy. I studied ethics at um, uni and, and when you studied ethics at uni you, you tended to focus on two things. One would be you'd focus on uh, the theory of ethics and the other thing is you would focus on um, uh, problematic cases, ethical conundrums. <coughs> those things which uh, were very, very difficult to work out and you try to sort of draw undrawable lines really and spend a lot of effort trying to do that. And I noticed that in Buddhist ethics that um, we don't spend that much time with those kinds of things. We don't spend much time talking about the theory of ethics, nor do we spend particularly much time sorting out the more problematic and delicate and difficult ethical questions. But what we, what we put our emphasis on and what the, the, the main focus of is understanding how a moral life and an ethical life is healthy for the mind. And so encouraging uh, uh, the, the keeping of, a, 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 um, of ethical precepts and an ethical framework because it makes the mind happy and healthy and whole. And so this was a rather different... Uh, slant on it, which I found quite refreshing. When when I, I looked at uh, studied uh, ethics in in university, they would talk about uh, various different kinds of um, uh, this topic. It's like meta ethics is 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 the 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 like what does it mean to say something is good. Okay, so when we say something is good, what kind of statement are we saying and what does that mean? And uh, like most of the great philosophical questions, it's, it's one which is not really answerable, but one which you can learn from uh, uh, the process of, of thinking about the answer and reflecting on the answer, even though you might not actually 
um, get very far or, or might feel like you're going around in circles some of the time. And uh, some of the answers which are offered to, offered to that question, uh, the classic, of course, the first person that we know of who explicitly raised the question and made it very central was, of course, Socrates. And uh, this was essential to his method was to, to not worry too much about asking, you know, what is what is good and what is bad in any particular circumstance, but asking what about the abstract or the generalized notion about goodness and badness. And, and Socrates, in accordance with his um, general theories, believed that there is a, some kind of... Uh, that, that there is a kind of uh, ideal realm uh, where these kinds of notions existed. And so... Each of each individual act of goodness or badness, which we see around us, in some way partakes of this ideal notion, or this what he calls sometimes as the form of the good or the form of the bad. And so, uh, everything that we actually, every example of goodness and badness that we see is like a, a, a diluted or, or imperfect representation of this kind of ideal form, and that ideal form of the good. Uh, existed in a more fundamental sense, in, a, in an eternal, changeless sense, uh, which was more somehow more true, more real than the ephemeral world of the senses. And uh, Plato, uh, Socrates, you know, as as recorded by his student Plato, believed that we could uh, gain access to this realm of uh, the, the 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 kind of the abstract ideal of the good through reason and logic and uh, and that this would reveal the truth to us but interestingly enough if we look closely more closely at some of the Socratic dialogues what he's actually saying is that um, is that the, the truth or that knowledge that we have in our minds is something which we know already and this is something which I think modern um, uh, expositions of, of uh, Platonic thought have tended to sideline, but it's actually fundamental to his epistemology is that we already know because we've, we've learnt about it and we've known it in our past lives. And this is what he states quite explicitly and quite centrally, that in our past lives we have already learnt all of these things. And so what we have to do in this life is not to actually learn them but to remember them. So for Plato or for Socrates, then we used reason as a way of, of like calling up, reminding ourselves of those truths, those eternal truths which we've already known because of our experience in countless past lives. <clears throat> of course, other people have a different idea of what the good is. In the Judaic tradition, the good emerged as a covenant between God and his people. So this is another very important idea of what the good is. And the Judaic tradition, like all religious traditions, emerged from this kind of very primitive, magical and mythical kind of sphere where God was this kind of... Um, originally, the Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, was originally a storm God. It's very apt for tonight. And uh, it was like this kind of uh, erratic and unpredictable force or force of nature which just moved across the sky and could deal out death and destruction willy-nilly without any kind of um, uh, control or anything like that. And so the power of God was quite um, was, was very terrifying because it could be unleashed in, a, in, a, in positive or negative ways and one couldn't really predict or, or, or um, uh, channel that in any, in any way. And uh, so this was the, the great... Uh, achievement after the the um, uh, the flood narrative, and uh, where where God put put a rainbow in the sky as a sign of His covenant that He would not send a flood like that again to destroy the whole world, and so we have this idea of God actually making deals, making contracts with His people, and so the 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 idea of the good then becomes the idea of a contract or a covenant. Uh, so in partly it's, divine, it's a divine decree. It's like from a power from above which has said this is what is good and this is what is bad, so God has created this. But it's also embodied and embedded within it like an agreement, historical agreement within people in a certain place and time. And that notion 
of the good as a contract has been very influential in our society uh, and it's very important to, to understand this. Uh, for example, in, in things like developing this, uh, ideas like, say, a constitution. So the idea that a nation has a constitution is ultimately descended from this idea of a covenant in the Judeo-Christian tradition where, where people, and like the American constitution, of course, says, we the people. And this originally harks back to that idea of making a covenant, making a binding agreement that will hold people together. And the, you know, the, the United Nations, bills of rights, and so on and so forth, these also <coughs> come from similar kinds of ideas. So these kinds of ideas, so, so in, in, in um, that, that tradition, the idea of moral laws, in a sense, are felt to be kind of written on stone, like, like the, the Ten Commandments are kind of written on stone. Of course, commandment is, is, is quite a, um, you know, it's quite a patriarchal, quite a paternalistic thing, okay? Thou shalt. And so you have this message from above that says you should do this, and then it's engraven in stone. The whole thing about, of course, engraving something in stone is that it's permanent. And in the ancient world, uh, inscribing something in stone was a way, basically, of making it permanent, making it last forever. Uh, and that ensured cultural continuity. Remember that then in those days there were tribes. They were always fighting for survival, literally fighting for survival. And they were desperately concerned with how they would uh, pass on their cultural knowledge, how they would pass on what they had learnt to future generations and sustain themselves. This is almost like a, a Darwinian thing, that the, the, the ones who were not able to do that, they would pass away. We don't know anything about them. The successful ones were in some way able to encapsulate and formulate their own uh, uh, wisdom and pass that on. And one of the ways they would do that was through literally through gra gra uh, engraving in stone their uh, covenants, their, their rules and so on. We find this in many places in the ancient world. So this would be uh, uh, future generations could remember the wisdom of, of the, the elders. So these are some of the ideas about what the good is. And uh, in, in course, in modern times, a lot of these ideas have been critiqued and, and it's very difficult for us to accept this notion, this kind of absolute note. We're uncomfortable with these absolute notions of what, what is good and what is bad. Um, we're uncomfortable with the idea of this kind of platonic abstract realm of forms where there's somehow this perfect idea of the good. We, we, we want to pin things down more than that. We want something more verifiable, more, more um, testable. And we don't like the idea particularly of, of, of the good as being like a, you know, thou shalt do this, do that. We don't, want to, we don't want people going around telling us what to do all the time. So we're not comfortable with these notions either. And so modern philosophers have developed different kinds of theories about what the good is and, and so on and so forth. And some of them like Hobbes, for example, this idea of the good was like a social contract. So coming from this idea of a contract that, that people, when they live together in a society, make an agreement that this is how we're going to live and this is what determines what's good. So that in that case, it's on a social basis. Others, like um, John Stuart Mill, had this had a theory called utilitarianism, which uh, bases the good in what brings happiness. So the good is what makes you happy or brings the greatest balance of happiness over of pleasure over pain, is how he would describe it. Okay, so whatever is good is what brings the greatest uh, balance of pleasure over pain. And utilitarianism is uh, still popular among some philo philosophers today. For example, Peter Singer, a well-known Australian philosopher and founder of the animal uh, liberation movement, is a utilitarian philosopher. And it has a lot to commend it. I'll come back to utilitarianism in a minute, but there are a couple of major problems with it. One is that uh, very often what gives us the most pleasure doesn't seem to be particularly good. <laughs> so this is one pleasure, one problem with it. Uh, sometimes a lot of bad people seem to be happy. And uh, I don't know if any of you remember from my generation remember a comedy program years ago called Australia, You're Standing in It. And it had this, this uh, couple, Tim and Debbie, and they had a little segment, and Tim and Debbie who did their thing called Brain Space, where they were, they were kind of um, this very kind of hip alternative couple who were, who were all trying to be very hip and so on. And one day they're talking about how Debbie was saying how 
you know, rich people, they look like they're happy, but they're not really happy. And Tim was saying, well, you know, I was just on my way here to the studio and I saw this guy driving this Mercedes Benz, you know, and I saw him and he had this big boat he was towing along behind him and he looked pretty happy, you know. Then Debbie was saying, oh, he's not really happy. Well, I don't know, he certainly looked happy to me. <laughs> uh, Shut up, you know, he wasn't really happy. <laughs> and uh, so this is sometimes the problem. But I'll come back to that in a minute. And uh, so the other, other kinds of ideas that people have. Some people then try to get, get more, a bit more clever ideas of what the good is. Some people say, uh, when we say something is good, it doesn't mean anything <coughs> objective about the world. Okay? Uh, so we say something is good, we mean do... If we say X is good, that means do X. Okay? So that's another class of, of philosophical theories. When we say X is good, what it means is we're giving you an order that you should do X or a generalized statement you should do X. So it's, it's really kind of a, a, a different kind of a linguistic shift. It's just, a, it's just a different way of phrasing it. Other people say when we, when we say X is good, we mean I like X. Okay, so it's, 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 um, it's really a statement of our own preferences and values rather than a statement of anything objective in the world. So these are just some of the ways that philosophers have tried to look at this question. Now, from a Buddhist point of view, uh, the closest, I think, that the Buddhist point of view comes to is the utilitarian perspective. And remember, the utilitarian perspective is based on the balance of pleasure and pain. And, of course, it's very Buddhist, isn't it? Because Buddhism talks about dukkha and suffering and the way out of suffering. So as soon as we're, we're starting to talk about uh, pleasure and pain, then we're starting to be in a realm that's a bit more meaningful. And you know a lot of a lot of the, the philosophical ideas around what is the good and so on, they're either kind of implausible and abstract, like the Platonic theories and so on, or they're not very pleasant, like the the thou shalt kind of idea, or or they're they're a bit um, uh, kind of seem to miss the point. Like a lot of the modern theories, to me, they all seem to kind of miss the point about what what it is. It seems seem to kind of um, like leech meaning out of these ideas. And, and we've got a kind of a problem in our, in our modern age, which is that our, our traditional verities have been questioned. Our cultural values have been shown to be relative. And, of course, this is something which has been known for a long time and it was mentioned, I can't remember who now, one of the Greek philosophers uh, mentioned that uh, in, when, in Greece all of the gods and the goddesses had white skin and blue eyes and blonde hair but when he went down to Ethiopia they all had black skin and, and snub noses and uh, so he kind of noticed this kind of cultural relativism and uh, even the Buddha talked about this sometime and he talked about for example the caste system in society and that the Indian caste system Indian was based on the four castes and he mentioned that among the Greeks uh, that there wasn't any caste system and there was only the, the uh, free people and the slaves was the only two divisions of society. So, uh, so we, we've sort of entered this age since the colonial era where cultural relativism is, is uh, kind of the, 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 one of the main features. And... We, we realize that, you know, we're very happy to realize that, well, on a certain level, you know, there, there are things like, there are customs and ways of doing things which are, uh, are obviously culturally based. If you're in Europe and you greet somebody, you shake their hand. If you're in Asia, you greet somebody, you make, a, make Anjali. And we recognize that these are just different cultures and uh, we're quite happy to, as they say, to when in, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Yeah, so we, we, we adapt ourselves to different cultures and this is, you know, sometimes a bit, bit, uh, you know, a bit difficult or a bit of a struggle, but it's not too problematic. But then, we, what is problematic is like how far does that go? Where do we actually draw the boundary between something which is a, a culturally uh, um, adapted practice and something which is just wrong? Uh, where, where do we actually draw that line? And it's an extremely difficult question. And of course, if we follow the, the modernist or the postmodernist movement to its kind of logical conclusion, then you, you sort of reach a point where, where there's complete moral relativism. And that means that, that somebody in one culture can't judge 
somebody in another culture. So you have this inability to, to judge another culture. Uh, and surely that becomes wrong as well. Yeah, surely we can, you know, there's some things you just look at and you say, well, it just can't be right, you know. And, and we, we, we try to be, do the right thing. We try to accept and, and to not, uh, not to pass judgments on other cultures. But in the end, we reach a point where we just can't do it. We have to say, no, I'm sorry, that's wrong. And so we're, we're looking for a basis or something that we can make these kind of uh, decisions or judgments on that's not going to be relying on some kind of abstract or fixed idea of, of a universal moral law that's somehow inscribed in the universe, uh, nor just sort of dependent on kind of wishy-washy kind of um, moral relativism. So this is kind of the bind that we're in. And uh, for, again, from a Buddhist p perspective, uh, I think that there is a, a solution to this and there is a way of, of uh, solving this problem. And the, the solution is that moral, to, moral relativism is correct and is in line with Buddhist philosophy. Of course, Buddhism always talking about uh, 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 conditionality, interdependence, dependent origination. And uh, I have no problem whatsoever uh, with uh, understanding that that uh, uh, a perspective of cultural relativism is quite in accordance with these, with these teachings of Buddhism. As are other kinds of relativism, for example, like in, in, in physics, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity is also an idea of relativism which is quite in, in, in accordance. It's the same kind of idea applied within a, a different sphere. The idea in Einstein, of course, is that there's no fixed standpoint in the universe, that if we want to measure any physical quality like speed or position or time or anything like that, then it's relative. We can only make relative measurements. We can't make an absolute measurement. And so I think the same thing is true in our moral world, that we can't make um, absolute moral statements. We can only make relative moral statements. Okay? But there is, there is a standpoint... Uh, uh, we have f a perspective from which we can see where we can uh, do a bit better than just wishy-washy moral relativism and that is because our moral judgments, our most important moral judgments are relative to our human condition. Okay? It's not that they're absolutes, it's not that they're inscribed in, 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 in the, kind of the foundations of being or anything like this. They're quite conditional, they're quite dependent on time and place. But the important ones are dependent on that time and place which is simply the state of being human. Okay? And because there are certain things about being human which are, are universal. So, for example, we love life and we fear death. Okay? We like pleasure and we seek to avoid pain. We, 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 prefer, we like to be healthy, we don't like to be sick and so on and so forth. So these are, are universal human values which we can find across all cultures. So, of course, the way these details work out in cultures will differ, but those basic principles are, are rooted in common human experience. And so I think it's here that we should look for uh, kind of moral values which will transcend cultural boundaries. And I think the most important moral uh, distinctions that we need to make are, in fact, grounded in the human condition, which isn't necessarily absolute, absolute. It might be different, for example, in another realm of existence, another realm, plane of rebirth, might have different moral laws for some things. But within what we know, within the, the context that we know, the most important things are grounded here. And specifically, they're grounded in uh, pleasure and pain. And uh, here we come back to the utilitarian perspective. Whatever gives the greatest balance of pleasure over pain is... Uh, considered to be good. So the advantage of this kind of perspective is that pleasure and pain are very real. Okay? It's not like some abstract idea like, like for example, a human right. right. We talk a lot about human rights. Well, what are human rights? <laughs> human rights are just an idea. They don't actually exist. They're just an idea or a concept which has been kind of dreamed up to fulfill a certain social role. Uh, whereas feelings 
are much more real. They're a psychological reality which anybody here can, can, you can simply introspect, you look within your own mind and you see, oh, there's feelings, that's what they are. This is pleasure, this is pain. Yeah? It's very, quite straightforward in that way. So we can directly investigate experience and see these things in a way that we can't see, uh, say, a human right. We can only understand this conceptually. So this aspect of utilitarianism or of a Buddhist ethical system is very useful. So, and, and in, in simple cases, we can understand that this is very um, uh, uh, useful and a very good, good uh, grounding. You know, we know that, for example, if, if somebody's hungry, then they're experiencing pain and we give them food. And that, that's something good because they feel pleasure because of that. It makes them healthy and uh, in that kind of case is relatively straightforward and, and, and unproblematic. Of course, there are many cases which are not so uh, easy to work out, uh, pra either practically or theoretically. And this is one of the things, the great theoretical objections to utilitarianism is that, um, you know, how can you work out all the implications of, of what causes pleasure and pain? Well, that's, that's a good question. It is very difficult, probably impossible in practical circumstances. But... And the other one is, uh, why, why do good people experience suffering? Why do bad people experience pleasure? And of course the answer to that from a Buddhist point of view is, to, is the uh, law of karma. And so these things are not really problematic from a Buddhist point of view. And so I, this is why I think that the, the, the kind of a Buddhist interpretation of utilitarianism actually solves a lot of the theoretical problems that utilitarianism has. Of course, you have to be careful here because once we start talking about the law of karma, it becomes a little bit like we're just sort of defaulting to this religious uh, kind of impulse to uh, when we come to a difficult matter, we just explain it away by talking about some kind of unprovable, unfalsifiable, untestable concept. And, and you know, if I was from a Christian point of view, I'd talk about God. And if I'm from a Buddhist point of view, I start talking about karma, and it's equally mysterious, equally untestable, and equally unknowable. So this is something we have to be careful of. And uh, those of you who've come along to, to my talks um, uh, for, for, uh, over the years will, will maybe have noticed that I don't tend to invoke the law of karma perhaps as often or as readily as many other teachers do, and, and I have from time to time been... Uh, sort of expressed caution in how we use these ideas because I think they can get overused. They use like a general explanation of things, which I think is going too far. But in this specific region, what we're talking about of, of ethics and morality is exactly where karma should be applied. This is the realm, this is the specific realm where it needs to be applied. Now, the basic idea is that when we do things which are good and wholesome, then we experience happiness in our minds, and we can test that, we can experience that, and so that. Happiness, in part, is something we experience here and now. And so this is one of the testable aspects of it. We actually do something good and we can experience the, 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 the happy feeling that it makes us. And, and all of you have seen that. You've all known that. And that's already pretty good. So one of the most important things that Buddhism can point to is that very simple fact that when you do good, you feel happy. And it's important to notice that so that we don't think of doing good as being like a, a kind of a penance or something which, which you have to really, which is, which is you, know, you know, this is often how it's presented, you know, it's like well, what we really want to do is one thing and then we feel like we should do good. And so this is the problem with that whole uh, commandment aspect of good. When you say thou shalt X, Y, Z, the implication, the kind of the, 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 kind of the, the inverse image of that is that you don't want to do it. Because if you wanted to do it, nobody would have to tell you to do it. Yeah? Okay? So if somebody's saying, thou shalt not kill, obviously you're killing, right? <laughs> obviously you want to kill. If you don't want to kill, and then no one would have to tell you not to do it. So the fact that God is up there saying, don't kill, in a, in a sense implies that killing is fun. Right? <laughs> because you have to be restrained from it, because as you, as you want to do it. So from a Buddhist perspective, it's not about that, but it's about learning to appreciate the fact that, that killing is actually not fun. Right? Killing is actually very, very painful, both for yourself and for the, per for the person who's injured or harmed as a result of that person or animal or whatever that's injured or harmed. 
And so we take that, that precept. Of course, these days, we apply that precept. It should be applied much more broadly. It doesn't just mean not killing, but it also means, for example, like a duty of care for the environment is, is an extension of that same precept because when we're destroying the environment, we're destroying all the homes of all the animals that are living there. So it's through appreciating that these things actually make us happy. And we can see that when we, when we spare life, when we give life to other beings. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel very, very beautiful. So, so it's so uplifting. And, and to be able to not only spare life, but also to support and, and encourage the life of others is something which can actually turn your whole life and give meaning to it again. I don't know if any of you saw uh, the film called About Schmidt, which came out a number of years ago, I think Jack Nicholson, quite a very moving movie, about the, basically about this fellow who retired, had this completely meaningless life as a, as a clerk, and then spent all his life shuffling papers around these filing cabinets, and then when he retired... The day after he retired, they took all these filing cabinets and just threw all these papers in the bin. <laughs> and then he went on this journey across America and it was just so excruciatingly painful, but I won't go into all the things. But this, his life was just became so meaningless and so despairing and just so empty. And the only, the only one thing that was good in his life was that he, he sponsored a little boy in Africa. And so from time to time, he'd get these letters from this little boy in Africa that he'd send a small donation to. And just at the end of the, the movie, that was just all that, you know, he was just sitting there and just crying and crying and crying because just he, that, was, that gave his everything was, was, was a total waste. But just that little thing gave his life meaning. And so this is what we point to in Buddhism is that, that doing good leads to those very beautiful, wholesome states of mind. And this is what makes people happy. And... Uh, so when we think about the law of karma, one of the things that we're saying in that is that you experience the results of that here and now, but there are also other results which are experienced in the future which you don't necessarily see directly. And that is the same kind of thing, for example, that you might uh, that would happen, for example, if you were planting seeds. Right? I can plant seeds, grass seeds, in the back lawn of our house and say, well... This is going to give rise to a certain kind of grass, and I can see that grass arising. But I also know that in the future, after this particular grass has died, there will be more seeds and will give rise to more grass in the future, even perhaps after I'm dead. Okay? So even though I'm, I can't see it directly, but I make an inference which infers from something which I can see to something which is similar that I can't see yet, and I infer and I say, well, there's a reasonable probability that, that that similar thing will also arise in the future. And so this is that inference that we use to, to, to establish the law of karma. It's not like a proof. It's not a logical proof that it must be that way. But it's, a, it's an inductive inference which, which, which looks at the way that causality happens and extends that from what we can see to what we can't see. And so... Uh, in that way, the law of karma is quite different from other religious concepts that, that uh, are used, for example, like the concept of God. God is not something which can be inductively inferred from our experience. God is something which is utterly different from anything which we might experience, okay? and so can't be inferred from experience in any normal way. The law of karma can be. And so in this way, I think that those... Uh, flaws or, or limitations in utilitarian theory aren't really a problem from a Buddhist perspective. That uh, those people who do good really are happy. And if they're not all happy now, well, of course we're all receiving right now the results of karma that we're doing now and also the results of karma we've done from the past life. So just as, again, to use that example, if I throw grass seeds on my back lawn, Yes, I can expect that, that I'll see the, the, that grass, but I may also see weeds growing up in the back lawn, okay? Because there may be seeds of weeds in there before. And uh, that doesn't tell me that these aren't grass seeds that I'm throwing down there. I don't, I don't mis misunderstand that, to think that, they, that, that, that these aren't grass seeds. I just understand that there are weeds there as well. So when we uh, uh, experience uh, sadness, pain, and so on, and we can understand, well... Karma is complex, our lives are complex, and we experience at any one time a mixture of pleasant and pain because we've done a mixture of good and bad acts in the past. 
So by as a general rule, not as an absolute fixed in stone rule, but as a general rule, the more good things we do, the happier we become. And I think this is something we can all experience ourselves and uh, something which, which uh, is the understanding of which is deepened and um, uh, deepened and, and um, made meaningful, made, made, um, made potent through the practice of meditation. Because when we meditate, we're looking directly at our mind and we can see that purity, the lightness, the happiness of mind. We actually see that very directly. Uh, and then that will, uh, uh, can, can reassure us of the happiness, of, uh, of, of, the, of the worth, of the purpose of doing that good. On the, on the other hand, if we do bad things, then when we sit, come to sit meditation, we will see the stains, the remorse in our mind. And it's very clear that thing of, of remorse or the stain in the mind, the, the, the weight, that kind of he heaviness or sadness in the mind becomes very clear. It's very, very, you can't deny it. And so you, you learn through meditation what that is very directly, the doing good and bad and how that affects the mind. And so then that encourages you to do more good, to keep your precepts more carefully, to, to be more helpful, more, more giving, more sharing lighten the mind, bring joy to the mind and this of course gives rise to what we call samadhi, the second stage of the Buddha's path and then samadhi gives rise to the understanding which is understanding the nature of the mind and through here that we find freedom and so this is the, the, the context that keeping these precepts in, it's like a psychological context where we understand the effects and the influences of doing good and bad on our own minds and, this, and, and seeing this encourages us to keep our precepts better uh, rather than being kind of uh, enforced from outside. So this is my talk for you this evening on ethics and sila from a Buddhist perspective. So I offer this to you for your reflection, consideration, and any com comments or questions. We'd be very interested. <coughs>